here's an excerpt of an interview I did with Claudia Sarm. Now, if you're not familiar with her work, she's the creator of a very well-known rule for detecting US recessions. It's very simple, it's very elegant, and it's very accurate. But she'll talk about that in the interview and how she developed it and why she developed it. But she also is no stranger to controversy. She writes the Macromom blog, which is always worth a read because it's often quite outspoken. And she also writes opinion pieces for The New York Times and for Bloomberg. If you want to see the entire uncut interview and also get access to lots of other content which is only available to members, then you can join us on Patreon. It's very easy to do. Click on the link beside me to find out all the goodies which you'll get. So I hope you enjoy this interview with Claudia. I found it really fascinating. If we do get some kind of synchronization of policy between, you know, the Fed and the and the maybe maybe government too, then mm -hmm. would that be hyperinflationary? Because I get lots of people who watch my channel who talk about Bitcoin or who think about Bitcoin, whose narrative is, you know, fiat currency is doomed and we're going to get hyperinflation. Look at the size of the Fed's balance sheet. It's over 7 trillion. I just think yeah. it's quite unlikely given how good the central banks globally have been at keeping inflation at that 2% target. So what, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts about the possibility? Yeah, so I will give my polite answer here because you're very polite. It seems like, you know, uh, if you want to see my more like what I really think uh, or how I would say it, I had a blog, uh, my macro mom blog, and this was probably in June. Like it's been a few months ago. I have a post on why we should not worry right now about inflation, right? Like people do not like it when their paycheck gets eaten by prices at the grocery store rapidly. Like I get that. And I've studied consumer attitudes and spent, so like, yes, we are so far from that happening. And frankly, you know, in the spring, like we were, the bigger problem was we could have had deflation. Right, we didn't get there, but wow, inflation is low. Inflation is not a two percent, right? Like, and it ain't going to be there. Even the Federal Market Open Committee, which has been for over a decade optimistic that they could talk inflation up to two percent, they don't have it as their typical. Like the typical, the median FOMC member has them getting to two at 2023. And the last time they did, did their projections, the baseline was more fiscal relief. Yeah, like, so, and for years they have said, oh, 2% next year, and like, one two 2% next year, right? So they, um, and I'm not, like, they're not making this up, but, like, the tools they have have not been effective in getting it to where they wanted it, and that's heresy. I mean, like, it, it's incomprehensible that a monetary authority can't say, here's inflation and get inflation. They have been very frustrated with this. Staff has told them for a while now that they aren't getting it unless they do more, and then they yell at staff. Um, in a Fed speaky way. Uh, anyway, so I don't think that is the risk. I don't want hyperinflation, right? But we haven't, until it got cut off, there was a lot of deficit spending that was done after the Great Recession. And we didn't have inflation spike. Again, we had less inflation than we knew what to do with. Treasury rates, the 10 year treasury, like the long term interest rate on government debt has fallen for decades. I mean, I joked in March with some dorky friends that I was like, I don't know, is the 10 year treasury gonna hit zero before the Fed funds rate? I mean, like, it was like, what is going on here? The Fed funds rate hit zero first. Um, and the treasury rate has come back up some, but I mean, it's really, really low. Again, like there is no cost. That's like, the cost here is not borrowing the federal government. Um, but you know, inflation could come back interest rates on government debt could go up. I think particularly for the United States, and this really holds in Europe too, like these are countries that are very privileged in their federal debt markets. Like the United States is the go-to safe asset in the world now. And that's part of, I mean, that's why treasuries were so low, right? Like safe assets were kind of a thing in March, you know, and they still are, but, but that is not like a God-given privilege, right? That is because the United States, $20 trillion economy, the largest in the world, dynamic economy, we've got Silicon Valley, we've got pharmaceutical, like 
this is not just us, but like in Europe, like there is a dynamism. There is a reason we are the go-to asset. We can lose that, right? I think the United States, the biggest, you know, like European Central Bank, you know, in Europe and from England, right? Like that's where, that's what could like move it from the US or just like, I'm not saying they're going to fall from number one down to 10 right away, but that to me is another danger that I don't think is talked enough about in markets who seem to be very happy right now relative to the rest of us. Like if that happens, we have a big problem. And to me that happens like the treasury getting much more expensive. That happens not because we have borrowed too much. It happens because we have not borrowed enough and the U S economy looks like crap for a decade. So, well, I mean, is there a path from here to higher inflation? I mean, for example, if you look at the household savings rate, I've never seen a level that high. And so certain people, I mean, certain parts of US society haven't been so hard hit. And I'm thinking here about, you know, college educated, white collar workers who, let's face it, whether it's good or bad, hold a great deal of the US uh, proportion of the US wealth. If they've been saving through this crisis, then, you know, as confidence builds, perhaps they'll start spending more. I mean, could that be a possible way to higher inflation, maybe? Well, so, yeah. Okay. So after the Great Recession, you saw wealth rise. Like it recovered very quickly. And what we know, the Federal Reserve has created distributional financial accounts. So not just look at aggregates, but they take a concept, the, the aggregate concept, and they split it up. Like lower wealth households, higher wealth income. And what you can see is over the Great Recession and this recovery, we had for several years a wealthless recovery, right? So it was at the very top. That's where the money was coming back. Lower down, even people who had wealth before, it wasn't until the end of 2018 that like well into the middle class got back to where they were before the financial crisis. Now, I mean, if you lose your house, you cannot benefit from house prices coming back. If you had no stocks, you do not benefit. In the United States, a big chunk of the high net wealth earn its um, businesses. Like it's you, you either own directly into a corporation or you have a business that's very dynamic, like, you know, the founder, the startups, the, this kind of stuff. So, okay. So the point is wealth inequality kept rising. These, you know, people, families that have more wealth than I could imagine, they did not go on a spending spree. I do not expect Jeff Bezos to like go buy half the country, which he probably could at this point, um, because they hold wealth to pass on to generation, right? Like, so to me, that piece, like we know that they don't um, tend to spend. Now, there is, the saving rate is elevated and there is some money to spend when all this gets better. Um, but, and I can't know this exactly, but there are some private data, some more granular where this, the hint is there. Some of that money that's saved up is earmarked, right? The United States has had forbearance on mortgages, and government-owned mortgages, and that's basically almost all the market. So if you had one of those mortgage, you didn't have to make payments. That expires at the end of this year too, but it's forbearance and not forgiveness. Like you're going to pay that back. Now, and, and rents, there's been eviction moratoriums for, mo for many households, not Jeff Bezos, but for many of us, paying that mortgage, paying that rent, that is a big part of our, you know, what we have to, you know, do every month. And, okay, if you had a choice in a crisis, in a pandemic, would you keep paying? Maybe you can keep paying, right? Or do you like hold it back as a nest egg? Like a little security blank, maybe I'll lose my job. Maybe I'll have to, right? Okay, so I think some of that savings rate is not money there to go on a shopping spree. It's spoken for, right? So there's this really tricky thing. And the saving rate has come down a lot, right? So, okay, let me pause again and get the cat who is walking back and forth on the bookshelf. Come here. That's kind of cool. Yes, well, wait until she gets more creative. All right. <laughs> Here, kitty, go in there and go to sleep. 
Yeah, I was just waiting for her to fall off the bookshelf or something. <laughs> That's kind of cute because she was looking up onto this. <laughs> She's very cute. Okay. Okay. So, what w- one of the things which you have developed and which you're famous for, I guess, uh, which I was very impressed by, is you're on the Fred database, which for me is like um, like mana. You know, I just I just love the Fred database, and you've got the T-shirt, you've got the two time series, which are on there, which is the mm-hmm. Psalm rule. So would you talk a little bit about how you developed it and why you developed it? Because I think what people don't appreciate is the logic mm-hmm. or, or the reason why it was created. And I'll let you. Yeah. Know. OK. Yeah. And I will say from the get go, I did not name it the Psalm rule. The, the chapter in the recession ready volume, it's just called a recession indicator. Right. At the launch event for this. They, they started saying the psalm rule. And I'm like, what is going on? And I was told by Christy Romer, who had led the Council of Economic Advisors at the beginning of the Biden, Obama administration. I'm like, this makes me so uncomfortable. And she's like, Claudia, you have to own it. Any man would. I was like, oh, this is true. Um, I have to listen to Christy. <laughs> she's a hero. So, and, and yes, it is in the Bloomberg Terminal Haver database, which is widely used in the United States. It's the one we use at the Fed and then Fred. And I really like that was so touching. Um, and it's there because it works. So I knew that if you had some way to get money to people in a recession, like broadly, that the payments were the way to go. Okay, but this recession ready volume wasn't just about well, what do we do in a recession? They wanted to put it on autopilot because Congress is not always so good about like making the right choice. So it's like, okay, before recession, Congress can sit down and say, okay, we always do these three things in a recession. Let's just have them ready to go. And then we can argue about other stuff. Every recession has things that make it different. So we had the dot-com bubble in 2001. We had the mortgage market crisis and housing crisis in 2008. And this time we had COVID. Every one of those is different every recession looks the same in some like huge fall in aggregate demand, big fall in confidence. Okay, so take the things that work for those, just put them on autopilot and it clears up space for Congress to work on the things that are new and unusual. Anyway, so the whole volume was about that. I worked on direct payments. Now, if you're going to put something on autopilot, you have to have a trigger. So what I did is look at, and what the SOM rule is, And like, I knew this would work, but it turned out that other people didn't think about this before. Um, And I knew it would work because of my training at the Fed. Mine is like different than the Fed's rule of thumbs. And there's some good reasons, but I knew that a small increase in the unemployment rate is bad news, right? So what what after many hours with the spreadsheet, uh, I figured out that if you take the three month moving average of the unemployment rate, got to smooth out those bumps and wiggles. I don't want to send out a hundred billion dollars like on some data blip. Um, So you you take the three month moving average and you look at the most recent month relative to the prior 12 months. If you have seen an increase of a half a percentage point, half, half a percentage point, we are in a recession. Like not even the recession is a couple months from now, or God forbid, you look at the yield curve and inversion and like, who knows, somewhere two to five years from now. Um, But like, we're in it, right? And it is like, since the 1970s, there are no false positives. And it is within, you know, three months, four months of it starting. And I went all the way back to like, I mean, I think the 50s are when the series starts, and there are very few false positives. And we all go like, they're all then within a recession, right? Later, like in a couple of months, but like highly, highly accurate. Um, and that's the trigger on. Yeah, it's great. I love it. And uh, it's great to have something which is timely, you know, because GDP is just backward looking. And the actual recession indicator, the official one from NBER is decided by, by a committee. So it's even, even slower. Yeah, no, I've got, I mean, I have the best one for the trigger on. Yeah. The, the trigger off... And I believe in this, this recession has shown that this is important. The unemployment rate right now is not the best indicator of labor market distress. I mean, it's still high. It is, not, it is above two percentage points of before. And yet we have had many people drop out of the labor force in the United States. A lot of women 
I mean, I have to admit, like, having my fifth grader and sophomore in high school child here doing school all the time and me like being helper teacher, um, especially for the son, like that's tough, right? And there, there are families that, you know, especially ones who couldn't just work from home that had to make a tough choice. Do I go to work or do I, you know, watch my kid during the day? So because an unemployment rate is the percent of people in the labor market people either have or are looking for jobs that are unemployed, right? So there's been a big drop in the labor force participation rate. That one is tough to look at over time because it's like it moves slow. Women come in the labor force. So like that isn't a good, that's a tough one to use for um, like we're in a recession, we're out of a, like the recovery is okay. Um, employment to population ratio is used a lot. It's a little easier to grasp than, un- but it has this same thing of like these long decadal trends. Um, one that I think people have looked at a lot and I think is the easiest one right now is in what's called the establishment survey where they go to businesses and they're like, how many people do you have on payroll? And we are still just about a little, we're basically 10 million jobs short of where we were in February. That is more jobs short than any time in the Great Recession. We lost 20 million jobs this spring. I mean, that is the yeah, big number. Um, and so we're still, and I think that's the one where you can tell whether you want a job or you've had to step away. Like that just shows how many fewer jobs are being done right now and jobs have paychecks, right? Like how many fewer jobs are being done now relative to February? So to me, that's the easiest one. Now I, I have to think hard about how one would make it odd. Like what, if, what would be the right trigger off that would be robust to what we are seeing right now? Because we'd never seen this before. I right? think like this is very bad and different. So I hope you enjoyed the interview. I think Claudia has an incredible insight into how the Federal Reserve works. And as investors, no matter where you are, the Fed's policy decisions will affect your investments. So it's very important to understand that. And she has a real easy way of explaining those really quite tricky macro concepts. So if you do want to get the full uncut interview and also access to our other members-only content, then you can do that very easily by clicking on the Patreon link beside me or by clicking on the Patreon link below me. And if there's anyone else that you want to suggest as an interviewee, then please pop it in the comments below. And as always, thank you for listening.